puzzling details, unexplained bits of information, and forgotten pieces. With new reveals and bombshells each chapter, what are the overlooked details at Wano? Hello my Nakamatachi, this is Joy Girl, and we are going to discuss all the interesting bits and pieces found in Wano, which in my opinion have now largely been forgotten due to all the crazy reveals we've been seeing recently. And if you want more discussions like this, then please don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell. And also, please click that like button so that this channel can reach more people. But before we begin, this video is brought to you by Boxu. Are you stuck in a lockdown like myself? Can't go anywhere? Or just simply caught the travel bug? Why not bring a part of Japan to you? Boxu. A Boxu subscription gets you monthly treats full of unique flavours as Boxu partners with heritage and artisanal snack makers to bring you monthly themed snack boxes sourced from all over the country straight to your door, offering you a unique experience every month. And as a first-time customer, you will receive the Seasons of Japan box consisting of premium Japanese snacks from all seasons throughout the year, complete with a magazine detailing the origin and flavours for each of your treats. And here we have the Seasons of Japan box with a Boksu culture guide and I love that we can find out about the each individual stories of each of these snacks as we're eating as well as more about Japanese culture. Maybe we'll even find something that Oda took inspiration from. For example, we've got the... Ooh! The Mochan Dango Mochi and did you know that the Mochan Dango Mochi is made by Kyoshin Seika and the Hanami Dango is a variety of sticky rice dumplings commonly enjoyed during the spring hanami or the flower viewing season and this trio of dango is covered in sugar colored in the traditional pink, white and green. Yum! This might be my favorite. Kaido? What is this? This is the Puku Puku Thai chocolate flavor and it is from Ibaraki. Guys, I just tasted Ibaraki and it is delicious. And as we currently read the Wano arc, I can't think of a better way than to situate ourselves as if we are in Wano Kuni than to eat Japanese snacks whilst reading our favorite Japanese series. See, I'm Tama. To find out more, go to the Boxu website and to receive a Boxu box of your own, use my code JOYGIRL20 to get 20% off your first authentic Japanese snack box from Boxu. Take advantage of this limited time offer. Boxu! And a huge thank you to everyone as this is the first time that this channel has been sponsored and I'm so grateful to everyone for tuning in and helping us get here. But now, let's get on with the video. And because the anime has only just got to Onigashima, I will have to warn you that this will discuss manga content up to chapter 1018, so note, you've been warned. The past couple of One Piece chapters we've had contain two of the biggest mysteries of the series so far, with chapter 1017's reveal of who's who and the world government's connection to the Gomu Gomu no Mi that our main protagonist is currently in possession of, followed by another huge reveal about the existence of a deity figure called the sun god Nika in chapter 1018. The Gomu Gomu no Mi reveal goes as far back as chapter 1 of the series where we were told that the red-haired pirate stole it off an enemy ship and whilst not the first time it was mentioned, the idea of a sun god was only briefly mentioned a handful of times almost as if in passing in the earlier arcs and not many, if anyone, foresaw that these little tiny bits of detail would become relevant hundreds or quite literally a thousand chapters later. And these are just the most recent and possibly greatest examples of where seemingly insignificant pieces of information come back into play and are seemingly hugely important to the series. Which is why it's natural to develop a habit of questioning almost every little detail in the series, which I'm sure many of us already do. Heck, I even begin to question panels like this where Robin's dialogue was cut off, making me wonder whether any unseen words would have been of significance. But with the crazy amount of new and huge bombshells being dropped in recent chapters, it's easy for such little details and questions to get buried under the mega mysteries. Mega mysteries such as the reason for Wano's borders being closed off, or what sword's objective is at Wano. 
There are also questions that may not be considered mega mysteries, but are intriguing enough that a payoff has become much anticipated, such as the question of what is Karibu's current whereabouts. Because he's a character currently unaccounted for, despite having played somewhat of an important role during Act 2 of the arc. But no, we're not talking about the mega mysteries, we're not even talking about the intriguing questions. In this video, we will be discussing the really minor details we've seen in Wano, which could, despite their seemingly unceremonious focus, could possibly be connected to larger reveals or mysteries. Seemingly unimportant pieces of information which might go overlooked if it wasn't for such a discussion like this one. Starting with the very beginning of the Wano arc, the question of the octopus who randomly came aboard the Sunny in chapter 910 and then pulled Luffy back when he was trying to catapult his way onto Wano. It's not crazy to think that there is more to this octopus situation if we take into account the scene with Kinemon and Kanjiro back at the beginning of Zo. As they were climbing the elephant, Kanjiro covered Kinemon's eyes and whilst this was played off as a joke back then, upon the revelation of Kanjiro as a traitor, this scene contained enough hints to be retrospectively viewed as a piece of foreshadowing detail where Kanjiro was covering Kinemon's eyes as to prevent him from seeing the minx. Like Kanjiro back at Zo, could the octopus have had a deeper reason why it was preventing Luffy from stepping foot at Wano? Does it serve as a gatekeeper as part of Wano's policy of closed borders? The octopus pulling Luffy back did serve a purpose as it became the reason why Luffy landed away from the rest of the crew and wound up on a different shore where he met Tama. So it could also just have been a minor plot device, but it could also be one that comes to be used later on. Like in Fishman Island, where we saw Surume, the fearsome Kraken get tamed by the Straw Hats and actually come to aid them later in the arc. But the octopus isn't the only mystical creature that comes to mind when we think of minor things that could have a payoff later in the arc. Another such creature is the mountain god that was hyped up during its introduction in Odin's flashback. The emphasis on Yamasan's ferocity could have just been to contextualize just how great Odin is as it was used as a part of his introductory battle and reputation as a destructive force. But then we see the white boar parent and child later on in the flashback with Koyama seemingly the one carrying Odin during the daimyo procession to the flower capital. And maybe this reappearance should be just taken at face value, just to clarify the mountain god's survival and the passage of time to showcase Koyama's growth, but this reappearance does suggest that there was a continued relationship between Odin and the White Boars, which makes me wonder how they would have reacted to his death. So similar to the octopus, is it possible that we will see Yama and Koyama come back and maybe even assist in saving the Wano citizens, which will be a contrast to its destructive introduction. Another detail which piqued my interest is the tiny focus we've seen on Kokeshi dolls. Brooke told us that he encountered a room filled with Kokeshi dolls when some of the crew were investigating Orochi's castle. And this wasn't the only time we've come across Kokeshi dolls in the story, because Tenguyama was introduced to us as a Kokeshi doll collector. And this just seems to be an odd, and also a specific piece of detail, to become featured twice. Shinobu is even shown muttering to herself when Brooke mentions it, which could be interpreted as the Kunoichi being unsure of what Kokeshi dolls are, or does it have further significance or relevance? One thing this does though, is that this strengthens the theory that Tenguyama is actually Kozuki Sukiyaki in disguise, which is a theory that has gotten further popularized since the news that the two are voiced by the same voice actor in the animation. But maybe this reference to Kokeshi dolls was a foreshadowing provided within the series itself. In a series where Sanji's seemingly passing comment of his North Blue origins culminated in an entire arc centered around his family, it's hard not to overanalyze a character's reaction, especially something as distinct as Shinobu's surprise or confusion about Kokeshi dolls. We also have some aesthetic mysteries, such as Fukuro Kuju's ever growing forehead and earlobes, which have elongated over time. Seriously, look at the difference between his youthful appearance and how he is now. This may of course be simply just that, an aesthetic decision to comically showcase the passage of time. 
But in a series where we have characters like Senor Pink, whose design is one of the most ridiculous designs only to find the deeper reason behind the man's choice of attire to be one of the best side character backstories seen in the series. It's hard to not dwell on a character's appearance and question every unique element about them. If Oda's editor didn't convince the mangaka to include Senor Pink's backstory in the manga, then I can say with absolute certainty that our perception of Senor Pink would be completely different. He would just be some eccentric character in Dressrosa, weirdly dressed up as a baby. Which has me wondering whether Fukuro Kuju will be given the same treatment. Or maybe it will be told to us through other media. After all, there are some mysteries that were answered through the use of SBS or Viva cards. Earlier on in one of my videos, I discussed the theory that I had about Yasui not being Toko's biological father, which was a question that arose after observing the age gap between the two characters, and this was actually confirmed to us by way of a recent Viva card. And with all the mega mysteries and recent reveals, I wouldn't actually mind if we had these smaller questions resolved in this way outside of the manga itself. But let me know what you think and whether there are any details which I missed but you are dying to find out about. And like I said, this video is only focused on the seemingly insignificant details but there are plenty of real unresolved questions for us to discuss so don't forget to subscribe for more of these videos. Thank you to our patrons who help produce the channel's videos. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.